So, I want to talk about now um, C++ 17 and C++ 22. <laughs> the future of C++ 11. Okay, which is what some promise? No promises there, but that's the that's the writing on the wall. All right. So I led off with some of these ideas about you know you see an open MP pass. Why is this not displaying? couple of slides I, I, I demonstrated. The, the second slide had these atomics, and you saw what I did there. That's yeah. very low-level parallelism. Okay. I, I thought high-level parallelism was like distributed across a large number of different computers. So it was a different model of parallelism. So uh, there was a slide that showed I showed distributed parallelism, yeah. where by default memory is private. And then the next slide I showed that um, shared memory <coughs> parallelism. They're just different models. They're both high-level, for some definitional high-level. But it means that it pretty much means that you don't have to get down to the nitty gritty of managing every atomics, every operation. You're basically talking about things at a variable level, at a function level. Right. Okay. That's why it's high level. Which one are you doing? The I'm um, the HPX stock. Okay, good. I, yeah, I work with Hartman. Okay. Yeah, I know Hartman. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's let's get into a little bit. Um, so. This, this is a, actually kind of a standards report in some ways. You know, talking about what, what, what we talked about in the last couple of weeks. Um, we had one meeting post-standard ratification. Some of you guys already know this. Um, we're interested in developing, adapting this bus train delivery model. And two dates that people have flown about is 2017 and 2022 as delivery dates. Almost every five years. In reality, it probably will be a couple of years, a little, a little more beyond that. Um, we noticed that the most successful test run was a technical, was technical report allowing you to pre-test, um, which was pre-tested by Boost. And subsequently, out of that, 14 of, is it 13 or 14, of, out of 14 of, of those TL libraries were both were incorporated into the standard. The only one that wasn't incorporated was um, the special math library. The only, the only reason that went to, uh, went to its own standard is because people felt it was just too specialized. Okay? It had things like, you know, uh, Bessel functions and Things like that. Which are extremely interesting. Which, uh, in some well, domains, if you have multiple PhDs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just copy a formula from a, from a, from a book and use that for your program. All right. So most of this talk I'm going to talk about is going to be about the the, 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 the Microsoft Summit that I just came back from. But I just want to give you some overview of what we're going with right now. Um, it looks like 24. So right now the standard is open, the door is open for, for proposals. And in fact, they have been flooding in. 2014 will look like it's a cutoff, okay, we probably don't know what to call it, it could be still called C++1X, but we've done that trick before, and <laughs> we, we still, we still make a trap. Okay. Oh, two more minutes, one of the big one. <laughs> one, of the, one of the biggest comments at the so standard on. community level was that we don't have the libraries, you know, standard is mostly, right now we have an, an order C of non-interoperable libraries. And we're hoping that, that the standard can help. At the end of this set of slides, I attached the, the talk that, that, that Herb gave um, at, the, at, 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 Kona, at the Kona meeting, as well as recently at Microsoft, at least some parts of it, so you get an idea what that means. But the idea is that he wants to, the, the, the group wants to start this, this, this uh, organization called PCL, uh, Portable C++ Library, also, I guess, couldn't even pronounce it as Pickle, in which they're soliciting um, libraries from various people, like, you know, from uh, QT, Google, Adobe, um, Apple, you know, um, Microsoft, I suppose. Okay. Um, because there's a vast amount of C++ libraries out there, and it, they're, they're unordered. You don't know that the interface is different. It might, be, um, it might be working to a different standard level. 
it would be ideal if we could gain some of those, gain some of those into the standard. What we've been getting are low level, time, Eric. What we've been getting are these low level libraries when we solicited them. What we want are the high level libraries like networking, like XML, okay? Uh, how to gain an HTTP socket or, or something like that. File system, I, I only name a few. So in this sets of slide, I'm gonna show some of them. Um, the idea here is that we're interested in stabilizing for a few years until compilers can catch up. I also attach a, a bonus section here later on where I talk about what the state of all the compilers are. I'm not going to talk about it. But let's just say that we now are pretty sure that one of those compilers is pretty much going to claim um, relative compliance by in the next two years. Okay? And I think that's probably GCC. I'm not sure. But most of the other compilers have all been working up towards multi, a multi-phase release. Um, we, been, we started almost, um, I don't know, three or four years ago. Microsoft started uh, quite some time ago as well, and Intel has, has, is up to version 12.1 now, if I remember correctly. Um, so some things that are coming about, people are noticing there are some words that we, we, we forgot to standardize, like cbegin and cn and things like that, little things. Other people are noticing bigger things, like, you know, the lambda is monomorphic. We would like it to be polymorphic. Okay. Concepts is probably going to come back. There's a great talk by Spiano, and um, I can't remember his name. Is it Brian? And Andrew Sutton? Andrew Sutton, thank you. Um, about where they're taking concepts. Just, in short, let's just say that they took the original set of concepts, threw away all of them, most of them, and reduced it down to a set of about 30 of actual uh, usable concepts that they believe form a coherent system. Much of this based on um, Alex Stepanov's recent book um, called um, Elements of Programming, is that it? Yes, yeah. Elements of Programming. Elements of Programming. He gave a great talk about that where he professed that he did not understand any part of his book and yet it was still the greatest book in the world. <laughs> it was a great sell job afterwards, but it certainly intrigued me into wanting to open the book and see why, why it was such a difficult book for the author to understand. Um, it's only the first two chapters that are kind of Okay. Okay. And is it the greatest book in the world? <laughs> it's a very nice book. Well, it's a good um, intro to concepts. Um, so a couple, couple of other things we're working on. Um, we, are, we, we tried standardizing dynamic libraries in the form of, um, but we're not sure if that's going to work. Okay. Um, when we tried, it was quite difficult. Marrying the worlds of Windows and 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 and, and, and Unix and Linux. Too. Go ahead. I, I noticed um, serialization is missing from I here. Know. This is not a complete list. I have a later on. I'm going to expand a little bit more on that. A um, lot of advanced. So we're, we're starting work seriously on modules. David's going to come and talk about that later on. Don't miss his his talk. Advanced concurrency abstractions. We're looking at Silk plus plus continuation, TPB, PPL, transactional memory. Um, there are other failed features from C++ OX, and I'm not entirely sure they're going to go, go, go forward. Um, so the thing is that people don't re really clearly distinguish between library components and, and language components anyway. But certainly there are other things that in C++ OneX that we do want to talk about. I want to get to this particular slide in terms of potential C++ OneX proposals. And I want to show this because I wanted you guys to see um, what are the things that you could contribute, for instance, to the process now. Things like networking, <coughs> threading, Unicode, daytime, safe cast. In business, for instance, GUI, um, <coughs> cryptography, authentication, um, just to name a few. Concurrency distribution, um, concurrency, obviously there's a number of them that's starting up right now. Math and science, big numbers, matrix libraries, um, numerical methods, um, and many other ones that I think we should think about, um, including things like, uh, like memory map files and parsers and transformers. Okay. So in the evolution group, what we talked about in Kona was that you want to break the features into four bits. There are these small cleanup features for, uh, for C++ 17, the so-called stretch features for C++ 17, and then features for C++ 22. We created this sort of framework at which we can ask ourselves whether something should be admitted or not. These frameworks are nice to create at the beginning of a project. In reality, I've never actually found that people actually follow it when you get down, get, get down to push and shove. You can read it, or you can read it in the slides later on. I'm not going to go into too much specifics of it. So here are the, this is my test, I apologize. <laughs> All right. Um, there was 
just a whole number of categories that I did separate into, uh, which serialization I believe is hiding in here somewhere, where they started and looked at all the possible different proposals or uh, some possible recommended proposals that have been coming out. So metaprogramming, they're looking at things like metacode, AST operators, compile time error. Templates, they're looking at member templates, local classes, local templates. Um, parameter packs, um, not being in the last position, but right now they have to be, things like that. Um, function, pa function partial specialization, does anybody have a proposal for that? It's about time. Okay. Default arguments for partial specializations. Some of you guys who know the ins and outs of C++ are going to love these. Okay. But at a bigger thing, we're looking at things like um, you know, reflection, the ability to support compile time reflection. C++ already essentially has you know, dynamic runtime reflection to some degree. So there's a number of proposals coming in um, under that. Large scale abstractions of modules, no macro, pound ones, dynamic libraries. Um, and then on this side, um, controlling generalizations, um, things like multi-methods, for instance, pattern matching, call generalizations, call optimizations, um, concurrency, lambdas, as I said, the polymorphic lambdas. Um, let me see, what was this there? I just wanted to give you an idea of what's going on. Numerics, big int, fixed point. There's actually proposals for some of these guys. Okay. Again, I apologize for the eye test. There's just no easy way of fitting this into a single slide. However, the only reason I'm showing this is just to show you the, the variety of things that you can help contribute. Okay. So this is the part I want to talk about. C++ Advanced Parallel Summit. That was last week. And here, a bunch of us, you know, because my primary interest is C++ um, um, parallelism, or parallelism in general, um, a bunch of us got together and talked about these things. Asynchronous operations from Microsoft, the then and the await operator. Executors by Google with Jeffrey Askins. I put forward transactional mem memory in a consortium of uh, companies with Intel and Sun and HP. No. Um, task, par task level parallelism, silk, TBB, and PPL, TLS interactions, okay? vector parallelism from Intel, and completing the synchronization libraries. These are smallish proposals that would make, that would get towards, you know, um, in fact, this is specifically talking about the locking on, 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 on streams, actually. Um, and then voluntary cancellation, something I've been working on for a while as well, too. So these are what's moving forward in terms, in terms of parallelism. I want to talk a little bit about transactional. I'm going to go over some of the major topics um, a little bit. And there are other people here in the room who also attended meetings, so maybe you can also jog them for recollection. Questions? Where would GPGPU fit in there? GPGPU. Um, Fits in here. Vector parallelism is on one level, okay. and potentially um, these guys. Okay. But essentially, not much. Not much. Yeah. yeah. No. I, mean, I would so also say there was no. Not really ready. Yeah, there was no specific proposals for for accelerator GPGPU support. C++ app was discussed, but Herb has always felt that it's too early because he just put it out for it to have enough user experience to really be at a standardization level yet at this point. Okay. The only high level accelerator language out there, as I mentioned from a previous talk, is OpenMP's acceler accelerator proposals. But we're not putting that forward. Okay. Although, I, with enough convincing, I might look, take a look at it. But I've already got a huge task in front of me. Okay. Any other ones? I'm going to go over each one of these in a little bit of detail. Not enough, obviously, to you know, elicit understanding. A super amount of understanding. All right, so transactional memory was presented, and um, short of it is the long and short of it was that when it was presented in Kona, there were some questions about performance, questions about use. Is there really use use cases, industrial use cases out there? Okay. Um, all we all have heard this hype with transactional memory, saying you know it can do all the magic in the world, solve all your problems, and make everything easier. Well, it doesn't. Okay. The committee knows that. They asked us to come back with, a, with demonstrating which um, um, transactional memory specifically is useful in what specific cases. Okay. And that's what we did. We went ahead and, 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 and showcased some of that. It seems that most people are quite happy with the results that we put forward. Um, there was a large discussion as to how it was going to fit in um, in the larger scheme of C17. Well, the group, my group, 
had never intended TM to be C++ 17. We always said that it should be a TS, a technical specification. Some of you might think of that as a technical report. That's in, a, in effect, that's sort of the equivalence. Okay. They changed the name and a few other things. But, so the idea is that it would go out there as a technical specification. And in fact, um, coming out of the meeting, they decided to start a separate um, study group um, out of it. Right now, there are four or five study groups out there. Study group SG1 is concurrency. SD2 and 3 is network and file system. I'm not sure which one it is. Um, SG4, yeah, I can't remember. SG5 is now transactional memory. Okay. And um, tomorrow, I'm going to have a meeting with my group to figure out who's going to lead this group. Um, but anyway, the whole point of it is that we did. So we presented a whole bunch of studies demonstrating students who, who used um, transactional memory, compared, in one case, doing it with locks, and another case, doing it with, um, uh, with TM. And then in the third case, using high-level locks as opposed to low-level locks. There was some interesting data showing, and I'll be the first to say that they're not totally conclusive. I mean, if, if you squint at it right, you think that it looks like TM is really easy because it generates fewer errors. Okay. I myself am not super convinced about all these things. However, the most convincing case, I would say, is probably this one, where TM, we believe, is a necessity you see, SG1, transactional memory constructs, is a necessity if you ever have to do, do templates in, fu in, the, in, in future. Okay? And it's probably this particular use case here, in that the locks are, in, are impractical for generic programming. Okay? If you have to do generic programming and you have no idea what your template is actually going to be instantiated with, you are never going to know for sure whether there's some sort of unique lock mutex inside okay, that you can't probably compose with. And ultimately, this was probably the most convincing slides for the, for the group, saying that if you really, really want to use um, generic programming with locks, you're going to have to, at some point, introduce transactional memory. Okay? And and ultimately, I think the group was mostly convinced by something that Pavel said, which was that um, we probably need to, so, so what does the TM group want? The TM group actually wants um, the C++ people's input. The TM group has taken it to the point where they have all these different, sol these multiple solutions for the usual problems of TM, which are things like, you know, what to do with um, I.O., what to do with relaxed transactions, transactions that cannot be rolled back, what to do with exception handling in C++. So we've designed all these scenarios, but we don't know which is the best one for C++. And probably the best, biggest thing the TM group wants is this, um, this feedback from the C++ users groups. Go ahead, sir. The TM, it can't really avoid a deadlock. It just can make it less likely, right? Sure. Because yeah. event, you know, you're going to have cases where it has to pull back and actually do a mutex lock. Right. So it's more, almost, it's, in a way, it maybe is even more dangerous because now you're never quite sure if you have a deadlock potential there or not. And I like, never one of those things that would only show up in, on the, after you release the software. <laughs> I, I would never say the TM can totally prevent it. The TM can always make progress. It might lead to starvation, but not at all. Unless you That's a big difference, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes, nothing can prevent deadlocks. No, no, no real paradigms of, of programming Discipline of no, TM is usually if I mean, is lock free, that's yeah. why I cannot right. no, get into a cloud. Yeah. yeah. Even, if, even if you don't, if you never use lock, you can create a deadlock. Just try doing detach on twice on the on the same on the same thread. <laughs> You're gonna get that's deadlock. Still using locks. It's just there's no well, locks my, there. my point is <laughs> that it might, might give you a false sense of security because you might say, well, since since this isn't a transact, this is inside of a transaction. I, I don't have to fear deadlock here. Absolutely, and that's not necessarily the case. Absolutely, you could have atomics inside of, of that. Yeah, any box. reason that would cause the transaction to fail, yeah. it might have to fall back. Right? And the group is never going to claim that this is going to save you from all deadlocks. It's just trying to save you from the usual, the, the best cases. Okay, with where low level locks isn't going to be able to save you. Okay. Now, if you don't mix locks with transactional memory, right? Standard SPN. Yes. You are not really risking deadlocks. That's right. You can have deadlocks if you use both transactional memory and locks. But transactional memory, SDM is always implemented as lock-free algorithm, and there's always a guarantee that at least one transaction 
will complete at any point in time. The others might be aborted and restarted, but right. always one. So every time, you know, so if you if you keep putting more and more transactions, then you starve. Right? But if you have a finite number of transactions, they will all eventually succeed. Th there is no lock uh -huh. in transactions. So, so like really, I, said, I mean, really, deadlocks are eliminated if you only use transactional memory. Maybe you are thinking about hardware transactional memory. Yeah, I think that's right. Right, where, right. where you have only small size of transaction that's possible doing hardware, and you have to fall back on locking. Right. Yes. That's but if you mean. fall back on software transactional memory, then you don't have to start. Is that what we're talking about? This here? is pure software transactional memory. That's pure software. Pure yeah. Okay, that's yeah, yeah. There's no HDM in here at all. Okay. Okay. Um, in fact, one of the complaints from the previous presentation at Kono was that are we trying to push HTM onto the world? Because you know Intel has it and we think you know IBM has it and a bunch of other people has it. You know, it's not. Nothing to do with this is all STM. Okay. okay. And in fact, that is in fact one of the hardest arguments because does STM, because it's software transactions, <coughs> will ultimately actually give you significant performance improvement? That's one of the things that. So there's some slides in here that demonstrate some of those. So there will be no hardware specifications in the next standard? No, nothing. And the and standard never has anything at all. <laughs> huh. Well, IBM has some chips, but already. BGQ, BGQ. Yeah. <laughs> The problem is blue gene is a one is one of those uh, what do they call it blue whale? It's a one it's a one song it's a one song machine. Uh -huh. So I'm not making any announcement by the way about the normal the common processors though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Notice I've been very careful about that. Yes. <laughs> no, we can speculate. But you can speculate exactly. The next one was about, the next big one that was discussed was this idea of an asynchronous operation. Okay. An asynchronous operation is something that Microsoft has been supporting in C Sharp and C++ CLI um, capabilities for quite a while. I'm just going to bring up the, the, um, the slides for that, which I thought was actually quite good. Um, That's right, the dot then, the continuation. So the department actually came back from that meeting and implemented that yes. for Yes. So we have we have something like a reference implementation. Yeah, there's a reference that. implementation. Harman talked about it. He was there. Yeah. Um the so part part of it for you guys who don't know, if you're not in the window Windows world, is that it gives you a more additional capabilities on the synchronous pattern than what the same currently has. Just to make sure you're clear. There was a huge discussion in the meeting about what exactly the current async gives you. It gives you nothing more than stood thread. That's it. Well, it doesn't that's mean, specifically the launch async flag to stood async. Right. So if you ask for uh, yeah. launch yeah. async or launch deferred, then you get something special. Something different, yeah. yes. And we talked about that particular issue, which I'm trying to up to dive into. So this is part of what, um, what this asynchronous operations do. Okay. Um, so right now, um, Microsoft does it using these when all and when when any for parallel compositions and things like that. Um, ultimately, this was actually a really good proposal, we actually thought. Um, like I said, there's a reference implementation. The things that actually ended up being voted on for most of these guys, so this will create effectively what's called stood future version 2 to allow you to have more extensive future capabilities. And out of that, I recorded the vote um, here. Um, okay. I'm still on transactional memory. Why is that? Because I have to do this. Five. Ah, here we go. Um, so we, we, we decided to adopt the dot then and the await extensions for the future. Not to adopt it, but to continue to look at it. So these gives these votes sort of tells you that. Most people are somewhat in favor of adding these kinds of continuations, okay, to, um, um, or these continue to develop these kinds of continuations to the standard. Okay. The 
next thing we talked about was serial equivalence of, um, of silk plus. Now I talked about what serial equivalence means. It means that um, in sequential mode, it should be the same as in, in multi-threaded mode, but with one thread, one thread running. So silk is this particularly interesting piece of work that uses um, basically three keywords, silk spawn, sync, and silk fall, to do almost all of the things that it does. It also has a bunch of a few other things like, like hyper objects and reducers and things like that. Um, to ensure that there's no data, to, to ensure that when you do something, this is the, the beauty, as I understand it, of Silk, is that it's very easy to convert um, any serial program into a parallel program with, a, with addition of these keywords. Um, and in most cases, it will, the system itself will take care of, of, uh, of uh, to ensure that there's no data race. There's also a second major advantage to all this, is that Silk, because of its nature, somehow controls resources and threat management in such a way so that it won't ca cause a massive explosion in oversubscription. Now, at first, I thought that that was partly because Silk does its, does its um, spawning by doing parent stealing. Okay. In other words, Silk is kind of like a, is kind of like a, like a cac does what's called a cactus stack. It actually steals from the parents, whereas most um, work stealing algorithms you're familiar with steals from the children. So it creates a root-like kind of an architecture. Now, it turns out that that's not the case. And part of the thing that, that most of you were looking at is that whether to use silk, adapt silk, in terms of the keywords that it has into the specification. Most of it was generally um, well received. Um, however, <coughs> there was this. So serial equivalence is, in fact, the key that allows you to impact on the bounds of on the space bounds itself. Okay. Um, there was a lot of demonstrations about what the various things were. Um, Herb Sutter came back and looked at this and thought that ultimately this is all about having either less in, l having um, less information requested. Usually means more optimizability. Okay, having a lot of it's less expensive or less execution um, execution guarantees means usually more optimizability usually means more optimizations. Um, again, I'm not going to say too much. There wasn't really a vote on Silk itself because it was just sort of a presentation to the group to see how they received it. The next one is about PPL. And actually, I'm going to be able to terminate this guy. And that way, this will make this work. So PPL is something that Microsoft has done um, by taking TDB, as far as I understand, and added a whole several other kinds of um, Operations like parallel and bulk, okay, um, uses lambdas heavily, um, has task groups, structured task groups, parallel and bulk. If you can do a dot run on, on a lambda in a group itself, um, Stevens here actually he can probably answer the questions more closely than I have. Right? I presented it in 2009. Uh, okay. You can pick up the slides on the Bruce Khan website. Right. Um, it's. Of all, the, of all the presentations, this was actually quite similar to OpenMP in many, many ways. Okay? It talks about the idea of static partition, you know, static partitioning for parallel fours, um, different simple ways of doing it, and auto range stealing. Okay? So I, this is, in a way, this is kind of like OpenMP. In fact, the syntax isn't even all that different in, 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 in many ways. Um, Arch Robinson then came up and talked about the idea of concurrent objects. The, the idea of having, so right now, TT, um, TBB has all these different kinds of concurrent containers and concurrent objects. They have different names though, like concurrent queue and unordered set and multipath and things like that. Because in some ways they're not exactly like what what their the original namesake actually do. For example, concurrent vector really isn't like a vector. It's more like a deck. It's, it's, it's more like a deck queue or something like that. Okay. And part of that is because the the way um, current STL has things makes it very virtually impossible to actually be able to say whether something to, to, to define parallel semantics. Um, all those push and pop operations are fundamentally at, you know, un unable to support parallel semantics because they have inherent race data races in, in, in them. Okay. 
So this is just a presentation to show you know, what can be done. You know. But out of this was one mandate that was discussed, which was, do you guys think it's important for the standard to ultimately standardize parallel containers by the, by the end of the cycle? Okay. Would you want parallel containers? Yeah. This is, I would think so. Yeah, I would definitely think so. I would definitely want to have something like parallel containers at the end of this. The question, though, is whether they're going to have different names or the same name with different semantics, okay? Because that's fundamentally some of the issues involved, okay? I think I'm done in about three minutes, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The problem with the current containers is there are so many variations. Right. If you just think about a simple concurrent queue, is it blocking on, on empty pop or is it fail on empty pop? Is it yeah. lock free or is it wait free or is it block actually blocking? These are do, some of the do, do we add 10 containers to the standard, or do we say, okay, this is probably what most people need, we just add this one? Or? Right. You, you point out exactly the problem here. This is a huge problem for us to work through, if we actually even can. Okay. Um, the next one came from um, Pablo, actually. He pointed out some problems with thread local storage. Let me just point out right now. With thread local storage, Right now, there's ambiguity in the standard to know whether this is referring either to the user thread, some worker threads, okay, or some task threads, task-only threads, or something like that. Okay? So right now, some people would think that it's just user threads, because you actually have to say underscore, underscore, thread, oh sorry, that's the old syntax, thread underscore local to, in order to acquire yourself a thread. Other people would actually argue that in some examples, this is clearly a worker thread. Okay? And you know, in the open RP world, you'll see that it spins up worker threads underneath. Well, that is also what, what is being done here in, the, in some of these cases. So we talked about that, and the consensus is we might have to start introducing naming for these different kinds of threads in the standard for TLS. You know, right now, leave TLS the way it is, and maybe later on introduce something like worker threads or task threads, okay? task-only threads or something like that, so that it can be supported. It's not a good idea to mess with thread local storage. However, that discussion did illuminate one interesting point, which has to do with interaction with async. And I'm going to lean on Stephen to explain this one. Microsoft showed this interesting implementation where for different for um, std thread and async, the two different kinds of async, that is the, um, the default, which is the immediate, and the async, passing in the async parameter, where you defer it later on to another thread. They were able to come up with an implementation which is significantly faster for async, async than the stood thread. Okay? And some of this promise is based on the idea that the subtlety is, here is this. Is this. Um, in the standard itself right now, because of the TLS ambiguity, it is never clear exactly when this thing is, these TLSs are destroyed. It says that it's at the end of thread duration. Now the thing is that with async, you would actually like them to be destroyed at the end of when the async returns the get. Okay? If you did that, the question becomes, are you allowed to spin up the next async thread on the same, the next async on the same thread? And if you were able to do that, you can save a considerable amount of overhead. Okay? If you weren't, then you would have to spin it up on a different thread and therefore lead to a significant amount of overhead. Okay? And there are two different implementations, one by Anthony, who just stuck to the standard, right. to, to the word of the standard, and there is Microsoft, which is trying to get better performance by not sticking. Now, I, I claim that the standardies is kind of silent on what it's supposed to do. I mean, if it takes uh, a dozen well, experts as, 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 an yeah, hour in a room right. to figure out, I want some informative notes there to tell us what to do. Yes, and this is exactly the problem. So there was a there was a motion to discuss the idea of if you didn't if you would live in a world that did not have TLS that support non pods, which they do now by the way they're in the standard, you're allowed to support non pods, but it turns out no one has really has code that that uses non pod TLS. Can we just get rid of that? And here's the here's the point. You see, if they were pods, then you don't have to call destructions on them because they're just bits. You can just write over them. If they were non-pods, you actually have to remember to call the destructor. Okay? When your async returns, you've got to call the destructor. That destruction is going to kill your thread. Okay? 
and now you've got a problem. And in fact, you have to do all these things to remove to queue up these destructors as well. Um, I, I at least know, know a couple of people, including my group, that does rely on using non-pod um, TLS variables. Okay, so that's interesting data. What, what, what compiler, compiler are you using? That? Um, <laughs> what compiler compiles that? No, not, 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 we don't have a compiler that compiles it. We're using, um, basically, we, we would like to be able to use it. We're using like okay. now, right. um, it's a version, but I, I at least know that people would like to. But there are library implementations. Right. The, right. And, and that, that, there's that, both I think there's implementation. The right. And, and so there are two ways to solve the problem. Right. One is do it as a library implementation. You still get non-pod support, but the, the name will be different. It won't be called like TLS, it will be called something else. Okay. Or the TLS will lead to compiler magic, so that the compiler can actually do it. So there was a huge discussion as to whether, first of all, is this allowed and it sort of came out at the end of the day that we probably think that this is a this needs clarification, better clarification. And there was a huge discussion about should we just take out non-pod uh, support in TLS? Okay. And the room pretty much split as evenly as you could. <laughs> five, 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 and pretty much tech five and five here as well too. So when it go, when it goes like that, there's just no there's just no consensus in that case. Okay. That's not gonna happen, it looks like unless someone wants to write a more extensive paper. So um, that's, this is an interesting data point. You um, and Lawrence Crawl actually said he had code that uses non-pods, and you would like to keep it as much as possible. I mean, just, but why do you guys feel that um, it's easy? This is not me. I'm just trying to represent the opinion of the, the whole group. I mean, it's, it's just I'm, I'm surprised to hear the, that I'm surprised to hear this idea that people wouldn't want to use non-pod. Um, because by, by, by getting rid of it, you can get back this, this optimization that Microsoft is using. I, I understand that. I'm just saying that I think there, there, there would be people who would say, well, hey, I won't have non-pod TLS. Right. Which is more useful. In reality, other people have discussed that maybe Microsoft could also switch to a, um, a threat pool or something like that so that it doesn't... I was one of these three strong games, so I'm... <laughs> 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 I'm opinionated. <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, that's a stupid question, but why is it so hard to just to, you know, call the structure on something in TLS without destroying the thread? So that's ultimately what you would have to do if you wanted thread reuse while making it appear that all of your thread locals had died and then were recreated. It's just hard so, to implement. That's yeah. the only it's actually not a concern for MS right now because we don't even have the thread local stuff, but it's something that any vendor would run into if they try to get it the best of both worlds. But it doesn't sound like it's possible to do. I mean, yeah, it should be technically possible. Right. You just gotta go queue up the destructors. But right, exactly. it, like, so in just invoking thread local C doors and D doors seems extremely fiddly. So there was some question as to whether people actually needed it or was it a case of the committee just saying, yeah, let's throw it in, you know, non-POD, sure, whatever. Okay, I, I'm gonna close up because we have a little bit over time. So I only have two more slides to go before I'm pretty much done. Um, Vector parallelism was introduced from Intel. Um, so this is the idea of creating an array shaping notation, allowing you to address components of the array. Okay? Um, it will allow you to support all the different SIMDs capability in a sort of generic way. This was actually being proposed to OpenMP as well. Okay? So here, here we are, you know, in today's world with that. You buy your computer and you finally are able to, if you don't have vector, uh, some sort of vector SIMD notation, you're actually probably only using maybe 12% of your computer because it's got a lot of SIMD planes that are happening, but you're still only using one of those lanes. Okay? Even though you may be using up all the cores. Okay? Beyond that, we had some quick talks about a bunch of other things like C++ AMP, latch, Google brought in latches and barriers and counters. They seem pretty innocuous. Um, concurrent uh, queues, stream mutexes, that's what we talked about earlier about the different kinds of blocking you can do on different streams. There was a big discussion about the cancellation feature, the ability to cancel. Okay, this is something that Microsoft has, I believe, in C Sharp, C++ CLI? Okay, yes. And, and, um, and blocking and through the, the structure. I'm not going to go over these too quickly, because too much because at all, because most of these are either just at a beginning stage and, or just not really, um, you know, not really all that controversial. That's it, guys. So that's where we're at right now after this meeting. We're going to go back to um, Portland in, in October and look over. And some of these guys will start coming up with real proposals now um, as to, as, in terms of driving this forward. If you think Accelerator needs to be put forward, and I don't disagree, 
Okay, you have to come up with a proposal to do to do that. Okay, go ahead. Should we expect the next mailing? Oh, there's a midsummer mailing. Like in July, so I can't remember. Yeah. Other questions, people? All right, I don't want to cut short your break time, so thank you very much for listening. To all the